Welcome to another episode of You're Hired. I'm your host, Lauren Epstein. You're listening to 96.7 FM, Arlington, Virginia. Good morning. Thanks for joining us today. Today, we are going to do a show, kind of a, I think, a very special show about how to get a job as an executive. A lot of folks listening are maybe at the director level and they want to move up to a VP level or they're at a VP level and they want to move up to a C level. You know, these are jobs that are very, very difficult to get because, well, one, there are fewer of them, right? So there's a much higher level of competitiveness. But also, it seems like, and it's my experience, is that it's kind of a, a bit of a more of a networking thing. But I want to hear from our experts. Today, we've got some some amazing people. Um, one I've known for, for a few years, and, and she's a, an expert in talent acquisition. Uh, we have uh, Kara Yarnot. Kara? Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Great to be here. So Kara leads the strategic talent acquisition practice at Higher Clicks, and that's Clicks with a C L I X. Yes, it is. It's a recruitment and advertising consultant firm. Kara led recruiting teams at a variety of Fortune 500 companies, such as SAIC, which is a big company here in in Arlington. Uh, she was the vice president of talent acquisition. There, she led a team of recruiters to hire 7,500 people a year. That's wild. Yes, that's a lot. So you have a lot of experience in hiring people. Most certainly. Probably Partic- close to 40,000 across the course of my career. Wow, 40,000. That's like uh, a chunk of a neighborhood. <laughs> yes, it is. And also on the phone, we've got Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Jonathan is the Vice President for Executive Search at Wilson HCG. Uh, prior to that, he spent some time at Red Hat which are the folks that made Linux. He, there was, he was the member of the talent acquisition leadership team and was the head of executive recruiting globally for the organization. Uh, prior to that, he was an associate and research leader at Egon Zender uh, and a member of the firm's CIO, CTO, and technology and communications practices. Jonathan, glad you're with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to be here. A lot of folks you know, want to have a career track, right? And, and they see other people who've gone from contributor to maybe director and then manager and all these other kind of amorphous titles where they may lead people or not. But then they get up to a leadership role. And then they want a title along with the leadership role. And those are, you know, those are the jobs that that I think most people don't really know how to get. I mean, they'll, they'll post them on job boards, right? Like all jobs. But I, I, I wanted to hear kind of like, what's your sense? So, Jonathan, I know you, you got a lot of background in, in the research and the data behind this. How many jobs as a percentage of all jobs in, in, in businesses are at the executive level, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I've primarily focused my entire career at the executive level. But um, for instance, at Red Hat, you know, we were in a hyper growth phase during my tenure there. Um, we grew from roughly 6,000 to 12,000 during my tenure of, of just three and a half years. And I would say only roughly, you know, we would consider maybe five to at max 10% of those executive level roles globally. Right. So that's a a very small portion. Mm -hmm. And what was your process? Did you feel that when you needed someone at that level that the executives already knew somebody? Uh, Yeah, it can come through a number of different ways. I mean, I approached it like I would any consulting engagement uh, at my prior firm, uh, Aegon Zender, which you mentioned, which means, yes, you know, one of the sources of candidates certainly is um, the networks of our, our current executive team, as well as our board of directors. Um, and, and as a consultant now, uh, working with multiple companies, you know, talking to my clients about their networks is very important. Uh, but there's a significant research component that goes into the front end uh, of any executive search. And, and that's done through, um, you know, market mapping uh, of, of executives across uh, the industry within specific companies. Well, okay, so let's. Let, I want to make sure people understand what you mean. So when you say market mapping, so you're on the recruiting side. What? So tell people what market mapping means. Yeah, so you work with your your client or the hiring manager of the position, whether right. So you as the recruiter, you as the recruiter talks to the hiring manager, and you figure mm-hmm. out what. What are we looking for, and why, and where are we going to find them? And then we go out and look into those companies uh, very systematically, uh, typically amongst the competitors and, and companies of interest, uh, companies with great talent, uh, companies we call talent peers. Um, and, and we essentially identify all the relevant executives within those companies and fields and uh, create a data sheet uh, for, for review. So do you think it's common for companies to want to hire someone who's already an executive for an executive role? Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, Doesn't that limit the, the pool a little bit? I mean, is it... Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, it's almost, I think one of the, the trickier uh, jumps to make is, you know, when you're being recruited for your first management job and you haven't managed people yet. Um, so how do you get management experience without, you know, being recruited into one of those jobs? Typically, you get promoted within a company, um, moving from an individual contributor to a management position. Um, but yeah, it depends on the context of the company. And, and you know, in, 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 in certain cases, when a company is in high growth, a lot of times you want to hire an executive who's maybe two to three years ahead of where that current role is. So they don't, uh, so they're ready for the role as that company or function expands and the scope expands. So sometimes you're preparing ahead of where the company will be. Um, but it all depends on the circumstances on uh, what type of executive and level of experience you're going to want. Um, in some cases, companies are willing to take what you might call a risk on a high potential individual who may not have had that size, scale and scope of position previously. Um, but they think there's there's more upside there and they'll they'll train and learn on the job uh, some of the elements they don't yet have in their toolkit. So, Kira, have you had the same experience? I would say my experience has been similar, you know, sitting inside being the recruiting leader, reaching out to people like Jonathan as an executive search uh, firm, executive search consultant. Um, and it really depended. Just in my seven years at SAIC, we went through multiple, we went through three CEOs um, during that time. And um, Were you part of those searches for the CEOs? Uh, the CEO search, I was not. Anything below CEO, mm -hmm. I was a part of as a VP of TA. C CEO was always ha handled by the board directly. Right. Um, but anything below that, so so each CEO brought a new approach to how he or she wanted the executive team to look. Mm -hmm. So for those people interested in getting into space, looking for those CEO changes or business model changes may open up the aperture of what that company is looking for. So we had one CEO said, I don't want anybody from defense contracting. I want to I want to infuse these next few positions with people that come from different industries and not as concerned about their personal scope of span of control, more are they bringing new and different ideas to the organization. So that was a really interesting time to look at candidates that we didn't typically look at when we were at recruiting at the executive level. Mm -hmm. Let's let's take a little bit of a step back. I'd love to hear from both of you on, you know, is it worth it becoming a vice president or a C-level person? <laughs> They both chuckle. Yes, um, worth yeah. it. I think is probably yeah. your own um, your own personal definition. Um, you know, personally for me, having been at that level inside a Fortune 500 company, it was definitely worth it. Uh, my opportunity to expand beyond my own function. I was very focused on talent acquisition. Uh, I knew HR well, but now I was getting exposure to all the other areas of the company, whether it was finance or IT or whatever procurement, those different areas. Because now I was working with those peers and. And that made me a much better business person as a whole. So from that perspective, most certainly it was worth it. Yeah, the, yeah, the, I, I would, go ahead. I was going to say, it, it gets really back to me, to, to context of, of the company, right? I mean, I think the CEO at a 50-person startup is, is a very different position, obviously, than a CEO of a Fortune 10 company. Um, and so, you know, I think when you talk about what does it mean to be an executive, it, it means very different things, uh, depending on the size and scale of the company. Um, also, I would say being a public versus private company is really a big uh, differentiator between your duties at that at that level um, and how you operate quarter to quarter in a public company uh, versus a private company. Now, if you're private and you're looking for funding and, and, and you know, that's a whole different set of activities. But but again, it's, it's really contextual. But to, to Kara's point, um, it's it's uh, it's a hectic lifestyle. Uh, you're always on and uh, you got to be ready to go when you accept a position like that. Yeah. So I was uh, on the executive of a software company, a global software company, and what I noticed about that relative to previous jobs is that it's not so much about the work that I do in talent acquisition. It's really about how it all composes into the business, how, how this is really about a business decision. And, and my accountabilities and everyone on the executive's accountabilities are really for profitability and making sure the business is running effectively. And that's not for everybody. Correct. So I think if you're looking for a, a more executive role, I think a lot of people see executive roles like, oh, they're the boss. Well, that's changing a lot of organizations, but, you know, and they make more money, right? They have more control. They have more power. And I'm, I wanted to put my finger, do the quote thing, because it's, it's all relative, like you were saying, Jonathan. But, you know, the question is, is it really worth it? Is it for you? Because a lot of people will end up kind of getting pushed up into that space and find out it's not for them. Because it does chew you up. I mean, you're working long hours. I mean, if you're at any 
significant company, you're working uh, as long as you can work 60, 70 hour weeks. <laughs> you know, you're expected, there are no, um, you're, you're, at least in my experience, and I'd love to hear from both of you, is that you're providing to the company. You're not like one of the person getting the benefit. You're, you're, you're kind of part of the, uh, well, there's cons- like consumers and producers in life, right? So you're a producer. You're producing right. and making sure that the company is taken care of, the people in the company are taken care of. And generally at that level, no one's really looking after you. You've kind of got to look after yourself to take care of yourself. Has that been your experience? I think that's a really, I have never thought about it that way, but that's a really fair way to look at it. You know, when you when you become an executive, you could have a team. And my largest team ever was about 400 people total in my talent acquisition um, organization. And I did view it, a lot of my role was to take care of those people, make sure that they were um, getting what they needed to be successful in their roles, getting obstacles out of the way. So you spend a lot of your time kind of in the care and feeding of your individual staff, but you aren't getting as much of that from above. You know, right. My CHRO assumed I was fine. Right? Yeah, exactly. And then, exactly. <laughs> unless I came to him and said, uh, something's really wrong. And then he also expects you to have the solution to it. Um, so you don't get as much care and feeding. It can be burnout. It can be lonely at times. Yeah, because there's no one, you know, you don't, I mean, you only have your peers. Correct. You know, and that's not a lot of people. It's not, and because they all have group. their own kind of specialty as well. You know, right. the the you know, VPs in finance, and I only had so much in common. There was only so much we could help each other with um, versus, you know, I needed to go outside of my organization to find people in my similar role at similar size companies who are having some of the same challenges. And so building that kind of network while you're in the role is incredibly valuable to you because otherwise you can feel like you're on an island. And that may be mm-hmm. another thing, and we'll get to kind of like what, what do people do actually to get those kinds of jobs. Yeah. But well, Jonathan, I, what I was your – go ahead, yeah, Jonathan. I would, I would add to that that, you know, as a, as a Boston guy, uh, one of the, the Bill Belichick quotes uh, that comes to mind is, uh, players win games, but coaches lose games. So, you know, you need to empower your organization to, you know, um, succeed in the markets and and in and, and, and the metrics that, that you uh, aspire to achieve against. Um, but when things go bad, it's it's on you. So I think you, you know, you take a lot of, uh, there's a lot of pressure in those roles to succeed, but it's ultimately through the empowerment of your people and, and the success of your company as a whole. Uh, but I have to agree with Kara's point as well, is, is getting involved with industry network associations, uh, serving on different boards and, you know, getting, uh, you know, your, your, your constant uh, benchmarking uh, with the best in the industry is really a great way to develop as a leader. Um, and seeing what's happening outside of your organization can often be difficult as well um, because you're so busy to the point you made um, handling a company um, regardless of size. So I want to focus a little bit more on what we we're just talking about is that if somebody I found for myself um, while I made more money, it was definitely not more money per my time. No. Right. And and so mm-hmm. like the idea of, of having this job because of money was really not the point. For me, it was about the work that I was doing and that I was uh, helping build an organization. And I actually felt like a business owner. And I think most people at the vice president level or whatever that level is in a company where you're actually in charge of something are like business owners. And in a way, like you're saying, it's kind of lonely, mm-hmm. right? I mean, the, the people below you, you can't go to, right? right? If the bad things happen from your, your level above, you have to kind of filter it. Correct. So there's that pressure of, you know, the guy above or the gal above is putting pressure on you mm-hmm. and the people in your team, some of those might be putting pressure on you. Oh, yeah. And you're right there in the middle. Is that your been your experience, Jonathan? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it depends on your personality and your approach as well. I mean, uh, I was fortunate enough to work under Jim Whitehurst at, at Red Hat. Um, he's ranked extremely highly on, uh, you know, the CEO ranking list uh, across the industry, particularly in tech. And he was very accessible. Um, I don't think he felt... Uh, you know, on an island at all, he would he would sit with the teams, he would walk the halls. Um, you know, we had a very, I thought, unique uh, culture there based on, you know, in and around open source software, um, which is really about transparency, uh, collaboration and merit- meritocracy. So I think it depends on the company's culture as, as well. And I also think that, and Kara, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this cross industry, but I think I think the C-suite and even the, the layer below that um, is is becoming more and more accessible, particularly in technology, where I spend the most of my time. Um, versus, you know, sort of that corner office, uh, you know, suit that uh, that nobody ever sees, um, you know, particularly in the in the larger company environment. So, as company culture and employment brand become increasingly important to attract the best talent in the industry, I feel like you know senior executives that are more accessible and maybe 
they may feel lonely, but they don't seem lonely, at least to their employee base and in, in, in their ecosystem. Um, it's a powerful thing to attract talent and, and do good business. I think you make an excellent point, Jonathan, you're know, thinking for the listeners that are interested in getting into that executive level, C-level position, fully understanding the culture of the organization you're considering joining, and is that a fit for you personally? There is a lot of introspection that needs to happen when you're considering moving into those roles. You, know, If you do need and want and work better in an environment where it's collaborative, even at the senior most levels, you really have to be looking out for that as you're talking to the company, talking to the executive search firm that you're working with and understanding that. Um, And if that's not a good fit for you, then you need to be looking at other opportunities as well. Yeah, I know a a person who just interviewed for a a VP level role and uh, they got offered the position but felt that they couldn't take it because they weren't they they would not actually get access to the C level. Correct. They would only be they their person who they'd be working for was kind of blocking them off from where they were kind of used to working. Right. And so they didn't take the role, which I thought was kind of an interesting uh, decision that for them, they felt that it was better for them to have access to to the to whatever they believe to be the, the highest right. level in the organization. And particularly if you've worked in an environment like that, like Jonathan was mentioning direct access to the CEO at Red Hat, you know, to consider a position where you don't have might be the same type of title, might even be more money, might be a bigger company, but it might not be a good fit for you. Um, and keeping those things in mind is really important. Yeah, and so, I, I refer to that as a seat at the table, um, and it, it may not be direct access to the CEO per se, but most uh, uh, executives who you know want to be impactful, um, not just about a title or, or, or a paycheck, but really want to make a difference at the company they're in or in the market they're in, um, they want to have a voice at the table, and I think that's what's most important. How that happens, uh, it varies. Um, but I think the best executives I've interacted in my career always ask that question. Um, you know, what, where is my seat at the table? And, and if it's not today, how do I gain it? Right. So we're going to talk about how to kind of get into this in a little bit. But and I really do appreciate what you guys are saying. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, we'll be back in just a minute. You're listening to You're Hired on 96.7 FM, Arlington, Virginia. I'm your host, Lauren Epstein. Thanks for listening to our show. If you're interested in getting on the show... You can give me a call at 240-876-0276 or follow us on Facebook at You're Hired. And you can join my meetup where we teach interview skills at interview skills to get the job at meetup.com. Again, I'm your host, Lauren Epstein. You're listening to You're Hired on 96.7 FM, Arlington, Virginia. Welcome back to the show. Today we are talking about how to get a executive level job. With me, I have Jonathan Edwards and Kara Yarnot, my experts on how to get a job at this this rarefied air position. So we've been talking about some of the things that go with being a vice president or a C-level executive. What are the qualifications someone needs to, to have to break into that? Like we were talking earlier, like how do you make that transition from being a contributor to that level? I don't mind taking that first, Lauren. I think um, you know one of the things I've seen, and I'm sure Kara will uh, agree here, is you know we used to have a lot more traditional uh, and structured career paths for executives. You think of companies like IBM and GE who did this extremely well, identifying high potentials at young ages, rotating them around to different business units, different geographies, and really you know uh, creating a pedigree for that senior general management position, ideally within those companies. Um, so they were grooming those leaders. And so, you know, when you get in those tracks, you, you fully expect to get one of those jobs someday when you're ready. Um, what I'm seeing more now is non-traditional career paths are becoming increasingly attractive um, and, and even failure becoming increasingly attractive. So what do you mean by, someone like, what do you mean by non-traditional career path? Um, so, you know, if you are, say, an aspiring CMO, um, historically, you know, you may have started as, you know, a marketing analyst, and then you grew into a manager of corporate marketing, and then you did brand marketing, and then you did product marketing, and perhaps you did, you know, some international marketing, and, and you basically put, you, you pick up these tool, these tools for your tool belt to become, you know, an overarching chief marketing officer. Um, what, what I'm seeing more in the market now is folks who maybe started in sales and then moved into product management and then, um, 
you know, moved into uh, another discipline and, and somehow became, uh, you know, that marketing leader. So, you know, they need to have obviously some marketing expertise and exposure. You can't just be an engineer and one day become a, uh, a CMO. But I think the ver- variety of experiences and getting exposure to different points of view is becoming increasingly attractive. And I think it gives you better perspective working with your peers at that level. So if you've worked in sales, you understand what it's like to carry a bag and quota quarter to quarter. If you've worked in product management, you understand how hard it is to, to deliver that next great product um, on time and on budget. And it gives you that empathy, but also that that camaraderie with, you, with your peer set. But I think it also gives you a more general business um, acumen uh, and exposure when, you, when you've had a non-traditional path. I, I would agree with what Jonathan's saying. I'm hearing a lot of CEOs talk about the fact that they want their immediate C-level team to have exposure and experience across the realm of functions in their organization. So you don't necessarily, to play on Jonathan's example, have to have spent your entire career in marketing to be the chief marketing officer. You might have, and they want you to have done other things. It may not be for five, 10 years, but maybe have spent some time in operations, maybe spent some time um, in finance. Maybe you did a marketing and, and human resources have a lot in common, particularly in the talent acquisition space, maybe spent some time working on employment brand um, and being able to have those cross-functional discussions at that at that table with your peers um, is, is really valuable. They just don't want you know the best finance person. They want a strong business person that really knows finance. And so that's yeah, really and- where we're starting to, to change a little bit of the profile when they're looking for a specific and position. I want to talk a little about about that because um, I remember in the 80s I, I met the head of marketing at Lotus Notes and he was an English major mm-hmm. with no marketing experience but what is it now like what do I have to have that distinguishes me in, in the way you're talking about you have to have a solid business understanding and you have to be able to talk about how your area has a larger impact on all the other pieces of the business and all the other functions and how they fit together. And that's incredibly important. You know, a CIO who only knows the technology and doesn't can't fully articulate how that impacts what's going on in a particular division or how that impacts finance's ability to deliver to the company, that's not as attractive any longer. So they really are looking for people with a, a greater understanding. How they got there could be a little bit different. Maybe they have spent time in other parts of the organization. Maybe they mid-career went and got an MBA and capitalized on that across the course of the remainder of their career. So there's a number of ways that you can gain that exposure, but you truly do need um, to be able to talk about how the area that you're leading has an impact on the overall business, whether you are a revenue generating part of the business or not. Yeah, I was just going to say, there is a danger here, though, and uh, I see this a lot when I'm looking at a a CV or speaking with an executive, is your progression and your career decisions need to make sense. And um, I often talk to a lot of folks who say, well, I'm a jack of all trades. So they they come to me with, well, I'd love to do a job in marketing. I'd love to do a job in sales. I'd love to do a job in product. Um, and, And unfortunately, a lot of my clients you know, that's not as attractive to them because they're like, what does this guy or gal want to do? And they, that individual may be open to a number of different things, but they, the danger of being a jack of all trades and over rotating into too many things is you, you might be, you might lose who you are uh, in, in, from an executive standpoint. Now it's all about the story. If your progression and the reasons you went into different functions all make sense and they're building blocks towards that executive position, uh, it's very attractive. Um, but a lot of folks have have gotten lost in, in on their way, and they they're still impactful executives. But sometimes they're they're hard to hire because they don't have that depth uh, that that perhaps the uh, the hiring management team is looking for. So, for anyone getting a job, having a story that makes sense to to the position is critical. Mm-hmm. How does someone know if they have the right story? Because some organizations might be looking for someone who's a jack of all trades, and some might be looking for a hardcore someone who's just been doing that who's written about that, who lectures on that. Well, uh, for... I mean, just one thing. I mean, passion is really important in a position. Yes. I mean, I I see a lot of executives working a long time who are in that role, but they don't really know what it is. Excellent point. Um, Are companies still doing that? Are companies hiring people in leadership roles? Like, I see this often in in, in talent acquisition. I Mm -hmm. see companies hiring heads of HR to run talent acquisition. Which, which seems to me to be a bad idea because they're not, it's completely separate. People who are human resources and people who are talented, two different things. 
but that happens in a lot of specialties. And I know talent acquisition is kind of new and recruiting is kind of new, yeah. but you know, how does someone kind of fit themselves into that if they're uh, coming up to a company with that that kind of structure? They want to, you know, they want to break in, but well, the person is not really their their peer. Well, I think to your the original part of your question there, Lauren, about you know how do you tell the story? How do you make sure your story makes sense? Um, and my experience has been from both sides. You know, hiring executives and being the executive being recruited to other companies is working with that executive search consultant, the folks at the at the um, large executive search firms or small executive search firms to walk through that story. They can truly help you um, hone in on you know connecting the dots and ask you the right questions because sometimes you made a decision that you didn't weren't sure why you made the decision to make a career change but in the long run it actually was a good impact and they can help you work through that and build that um, that conversation around the story of your career so when you get to that level having relationships with people that are the experts in executive search they have the relationships with the major organizations they've talked to hundreds if not thousands of people similar to you over the course of their career, and they can help you kind of craft that story so that it makes the most sense. And Jonathan, that's where you would come in, right? Somebody would call you up and say, hey, I, I want to get an executive job, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. Like, I, you know, my clients are certainly uh, the companies I work for, but um, I, I joke with my family and friends that, that everyone in my personal network, I'm also their career coach. Uh, but also, you know, every executive I recruit, you know, I often talk folks out of jobs because we have to, you know, co- conversate enough to understand if it's right for them, not only experientially, but to your point around their passions and motivations. And then again, culture fit and timing. Um, so that's a story you develop together. And, um, you know, you certainly don't want to spin things too much, but, um, you know, there's different ways you can talk about different experiences that, that may appeal to the hiring company more if that's the job you really want to get. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, different experiences bring out different lessons that we learn over the courses of our career and, and being able to identify those milestones um, and those key learning points, uh, particularly in moments of failure or, uh, or you know, times of challenge, um, those, those show a lot of humility and growth. So let, let's get in the weeds for a second. So somebody's listening to the show and they're like, hey, you know, I want to I get into that part of my career. I want to be a leader. They should look up the executive search firms in their field. Is that what would you say? I mean, and then call them up and say, hey, I'm, I'm a this and I'd like to be a that. I wouldn't say we, we are, you know, we're, we're not agents. Right for for executives, we don't we don't really shop them around. Typically, um, you know, certainly want always want to have people I know across the industry that I can you know call a day of um, and and talk to them about roles or or those within their network. But I, I would say I would be more uh, inclined to speak with you know the best managers that you've had in your career, um, executives you admire that you have a relationship and talk to them about how they got there and what opportunities they may be able to open up for them. Um, I think you need to have a good reputation in your area of expertise um, and you will be identified um, well, if you're so out let's, looking for well, it. Well, hang on, because you're talking about some really good stuff. So one, you said you said I shouldn't go to a, a, a hiring agency to, to network. Is that right? Or should I... I think you can. I, I wouldn't say. It's I mean, they're the ones who have the jobs, right? They're the ones who are looking for the C's and the VPs. Right. They they are the ones that have the jobs, but I think Jonathan on the point, their clients are the companies that they're hiring for. Yeah. So they're you know they're getting paid f- from those people. You know, obviously knowing who's in the marketplace is very valuable. So it does make sense, particularly you know, to narrow down. You know, whether it, whatever executive search firms, um, you know, there's all the national names. They all have you know functional setups, you know, people that focus just on HR and just on finance, and you can somewhat easily find out who those folks are. Uh, It's probably great to have an introduction into those people. So maybe to Jonathan's point, talking with executives you admire inside and outside your company, many of them have been placed by these executive search consultants, asking them to do an introduction and say, I know a really great person, Kara's really good at this, Um, would be good for you guys to have a conversation so that they're aware um, of you and what you're interested in doing in the event that they get a search from a company that's looking for someone with their background. But it is probably not the most efficient way. Um, Jonathan touched on something that I think is really important. You need to make yourself findable. 
Um, you need to have a strong reputation in the in the industry, not just with your own company or even in your own market, but you need to be you know out there. Whether it's um, writing for publications in your in your area, blogging, um, getting on the speaker circuit, because when individuals like Jonathan get orders from companies to you know go out and find people, they have whole research departments looking for people, and that's how you're findable. If you're just sitting in your job doing a gr- darn good job, you're fantastic, you're getting the uh, best ratings, and your organization is good, outside world may not know who you are. So you need to be building your own personal brand and reputation in that space. Mm -hmm. And it may not be that you're good. (laughs) It just means that you've got a good marketing Marketing effort. Yeah. Yeah. So in part, getting yourself out there, taking the work that you do, and and, and I would agree with that. I I do disagree that I think that uh, as a worker, if you're a manager or director, Reaching out to the agencies, the headhunters, the, the firms that get due contingency or, or uh, retained searches, it's a good time to network with them and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, this is where I am in my career. Let me send you my resume. Let's have coffee sometime. And over, if not then, over time, build that relationship. Because those are the folks that, right? I mean, we know that, uh, you know, network is where you get most of the jobs. Oh, I completely yeah. agree. I'm not I'm not suggesting that you don't do that. I'm just saying it's not may not be the most efficient way and you don't put all your your networking eggs in the executive recruiter basket. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I, I would agree with that as well. And I think some of the best introductions I get though are often from executives I've placed or have interacted with through the courses of search. And they recommend it based on my interactions with them and their reputation and my respect for them when they refer me to individuals that may be up and comers or already established, you know, I'm definitely going to spend that, that time to have coffee and, and et cetera. But, right. you know, there's no shortage of people that, that call and, and email me that, um, you know, uh, you know, are just trying to get their name out there and it's very difficult to manage that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's just another channel to these jobs. There's just multiple ways to, mm. to network, um, to carry so, a see, point uh, beyond that. So if you're listening to the show, I mean, one of the, you know, one of the biases that I think folks in the industry have is that if if you're someone who was referred to me by somebody I trust, then I'm going to trust you. Correct. If you're just calling me up, then I'm not going to have that same level of trust. Right. So that's just something that, that you should keep in mind. Well, and it, you it's back either. to the point Jonathan made originally of, you know, the executives you know in your career, companies you've worked at in the past. Mm-hmm people you know from previous networking, having those conversations with them, asking which uh, executive search firms they've worked with, and would they make an introduction? I mean, that's how, you know, there's two very well-known executive search consultants in the D.C. area that do only HR. I know them both very, very well. I was introduced to one. Um, So one is Kim Kim Shanahan, Uh um, and the other one is um, Betsy's last name just escaped me, and it will come to me, but um, very, very well-known in in the industry. Mm -hmm. And I got intros to Actually, Betsy placed me in my very first management role, um, and I have sent her many candidates over the years, and so we stay very close. And then Kim was at um, uh, Corn Ferry for a very long time, and she left a few years ago to launch her own executive search firm. And so you're just getting to know those folks very well and staying connected with them. And to your point, Lauren, of keeping it as a relationship. you know, It's not, they're, they're not just there to find me jobs. I'm helping them as well. I'm giving them recommendations. They reach out to me when they have a search. Who do you know? But even just sharing intel in the space. Hey, did you know this CHRO was leaving? Are you guys in on the search? Maybe I can make a connection for you. you keeping each other up to date on what's happening in your space. That's really valuable. And when a search comes up, I'm top of mind, whether as a candidate or someone that can help them. You're listening to Your Hired Radio. I am your host, Lauren Epstein. And we are on 96.7 FM, Arlington, Virginia, here in Clarendon, Virginia, on this beautiful, beautiful day. Good morning. We're talking to our guest, Jonathan Edwards and Kara Yarnot, about how to get a C-level job. And we've been talking about kind of the, the methods. How do I develop my career if that is my end goal? And we're, like, let's say I've been working for... Like I'll tell you, my, my situation was I was a, a recruiter for about 12 or 15 years before I really go went like, oh, this is something I want to be a leader in. You know, I was just kind of doing it mm-hmm. and having a, I didn't think that a, 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 a leadership role was important to me. And then I just kind of broke in. Like I just happened to get recruited for a job and, and started leading teams and, and that kind of thing. It was, it was fortuitous. It was not planned. I have to say I completely, so if anyone asked me advice personally, I'd probably give my 
you know, my, my advice, but not my experience, but just kind of, just kind of happened. Mm -hmm. So what do you tell people if they actually want to plan this thing out? Uh, one of the pieces of advice I give, because I, I actually get that question a lot from a lot of people, is, you know, hey, I've been in my individual contributor role for some time. I want to grow into a leadership role, but I don't see any openings at my company. One of the first things I tell them to do is to start volunteering for special projects, whether it's inside their function or company-wide, getting that exposure, opportunity to maybe lead a small team inside a um, software implementation. You know, if you're in recruiting and applicant tracking system implementation, put your hand in the air for that for that project. Um, you may not have a huge leadership role, but you're getting exposure to a lot of leaders. Now you're getting exposed to leaders in IT and leaders in finance who are all a part of that, that project. Or maybe there's a company-wide initiative around retention, and you are you know, a, a great engineer, and you really would like to advance and become a leader. Those are the kinds of things people are looking for to you indicate that you have an interest in leading people. So volunteer for that team on how do we how do we keep our best engineers around? So put your hand in the air for those things. It's going to mean more work for you. They don't take your day job away, but you need to start getting exposure across the organization more than just your immediate manager or his or her immediate manager need to know about the skill set that you have. So as you start volunteering inside your organization, that can start getting you on those paths and you start to be um, recommended for, for more advancement. Do you ever start out with the Socratic question of like, well, why? Why do you want to be a, a leader? It's, it, it, it could literally, literally be less money for your time. You might not see your family as much. It'll be a lot of pressure. I think that's 100% a fair question to understand why. And for a lot of people, it's it's sometimes the initial question is, why well, I want to make the salary that they do. Um, but mm -hmm. then when you dig a little bit more, you can start to understand there may be some additional motivations. And if it's only money, you know I would personally counsel them away from it. Um, but the, it is a great question to get started. Why do you think you want to go that way? Yeah, and it sounds like from what we've been talking, the motivation someone should have, and I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, Jonathan, is I want to lead a team to build something. Mm -hmm. I want to, you know, take what it is I know about my field and maximize its effectiveness for the organization, mm -hmm. de depending on what I do. Is that, I mean, to me, that's, that's what I think a, a leader should be up to. Not that I want to make more money or that I want to have a corner office. Well, I don't think anyone mm -hmm. has corner office anymore. Um, corner cubicle. A corner cubicle. <laughs> mm -hmm. I went to Zappos yeah. and I saw Tony's Tony Yeah, I've size, been there uh, as well. And yeah. So the, the head of Zappos, his cube is right in the middle of everyone else's cube. It's yeah. not even a cube. It's no. just a desk. Yeah, and, and it's, it's piled chaos. high. Yes. Yeah, with like three feet of paper on it. On, you can't see exactly. the desk. There were shoes hanging from yeah. the wall. It was very bizarre. Yes. So, Jonathan, I want to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I think... You know, I was thinking uh, Socratic as well. I mean, the, the classic know thyself as well is, you know, what type of leader are you? Um, there's many different types of leadership styles. There's different assessments. Uh... Jonathan? Okay, we had a little bit of a technical difficulty there. Anyway, Jonathan, you're on the phone, right? Yes. Okay, great. Awesome. So uh, why don't you just pick up where you left off? It's fine if you're repetitive. Yeah. No, no one's yeah, really so. listening to the show, just so you guys know this. <laughs> it's just the three of us. Yes. <laughs> like, I'm no, the only one who's getting value from this conversation. <laughs> um, no, happy to, guys. So I think, you know, one of the distinctions uh, I was making is, one, understanding what type of leader you are and aspire to be. Um, who do you admire, but also how would you be assessed as a leader? Um, but secondly, is there's a big difference between leadership and management. Um, often, if you if you want these C-level or, or senior executive level positions, um, it comes with significant organizational management. Um, and a lot of those great in their field don't always enjoy the management piece. Um, there's a lot of very senior leaders who are individual contributors. So I think that's a big question to ask is, you know, do you really like rolling up your sleeves, whether that's with the code or the 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 the, the design or the the whatever it may be where your passion lies? Because when you become a increasingly senior level executive, a lot of your time is spent managing managers and um, and helping them succeed. So that's a big question to ask yourself. Yeah, and, and managing managers. I mean, you've got to want to, like you said, lead, be with people, deal with people's problems, do budgets. You know, um, kind of have this broader expanse where you're not doing the work Correct. that you first started. So, And I think you also made a great distinction there, Jonathan, is that you, you've got to be a leader. You've got to want to be a leader. It's not about being a boss. Mm 
Right. I think that our culture has changed now enough that there are fewer and fewer bo- bosses and more and more leaders. That's that's a, a huge distinction for someone to kind of confront. And what can someone do to figure out if they are a leader? I mean, some people think they are, and they're not. What are some mm-hmm. of the ways that they can someone can tell if they've got what it takes? So one of the things. Yeah, a, no, go, go ahead. ahead here. I was going to say one of the things you know, particularly you know mid to large size companies when you start to get to that level, um, you know, there's a lot of internal assessments that they might put you through, like a 360 assessment mm-hmm. can be really valuable. And even if your company doesn't offer something like that, uh, you can find you new know, organizations that uh, you, you could pay for them to do such an assessment for you to get some of that honest feedback from your peers, your current management, anyone that maybe you have managed in the course of your career, maybe you're relatively new into into leadership. Um, and and get some of that honest to goodness feedback um, because to the, Jonathan's point before you can be a leader and never manage a single person you know really ha- be a visionary individual get people motivated around the goal that you need to ha- have happen but you may not be the person that's you know, dividing up the work making the structure managing the budgets writing annual reviews there's a whole host of responsibilities that come with that but getting some honest assessment you know through a formal assessment or even you know personally um, you know just by by asking people you know and trust to give you some some honest feedback so if you get the feedback that yeah you definitely could be or should be or it's something that you're you you should have in your path now what do you do? Because we talked about kind of marketing yourself. What what would someone do to market themselves? I know you talked about all these things like blogging, but honestly, like, you know, very few people actually blog and, and maybe it's just like, you know, write an article once in a while. Right. Like I know I have a couple of articles that I've written on my LinkedIn page. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's enough, Right. but... You know, not everyone's going to write or do this or do that. Right. One of the things I've recommended to a lot of people that I've seen them be successful with is, you know, even just getting outside of your own current organization and finding those professional associations that are in your area and getting involved with them. Um, they're always in need of people to volunteer to manage things um, because they tend to be nonprofit. There might not be any full-time staff there to taking on some of those responsibilities, whether it's helping to organize the annual conference, putting together a series of web webinars, um, setting up an industry mentor program. There's a whole host of things that a variety of professional associations put together that you can join the association and, and volunteer to be a part of it. Maybe you're not leading it initially, but you move into a leadership role. That's giving you exposure to people that work in all different types of organizations, but have your professional um, affiliation. And you can start to try out your leadership um, style there, try some things out. It's far less risky. You know, they're rarely going to fire you unless you're terrible, um, because they are dying for people in a lot of those roles. But that's a good way to get some feedback and get gain some exposure and you start to get um, connected to other leaders in in your profession, which can lead to connections to those executive search firms or even just a an employee referral to a leader position at another company. So it's kind of an apprenticeship. Uh, Set up your own apprenticeship with an organization in your field Mm -hmm. where you can kind of do some of these leadership and management things. Yes. Like all those things you're talking about are the kind of things that a leader would need to do, kind of the dry, very somewhat (laughs) (laughs) mundane things, Mm -hmm. but that need to get done. They do. What what did you think about that, uh, Jonathan? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the key points you made that that I really uh, resonates with me is mentorship. Um, because it it can be an informal uh, way of learning about how you might manage. Um, You learn a lot by being a mentor, um, and it's a a non-structured way of of helping, you know, whether someone within or outside of your organization. Um, You know, like I personally have mentored, uh, I call him a kid, but he's now 22 years old, but since he was 14. And, you know, it's just been a great experience in my life uh, mentoring someone on a personal level, um, outside of work and, uh, and learning, you know, more about my leadership and management style through that. Um, I've also mentored many colleagues throughout my career within my organization that I didn't manage. Um, and you have to, to Kara's point earlier, you have to raise your hand for these things. If it's special projects or talk to your manager and say, Hey, you know, I'd really like to develop my, my leadership and management capabilities. Is there anyone new to the organization and team that you think I might be able to mentor and, and help them get up to speed? And then over time, you, again, this gets back to that story. Um, you're building a story of not only your interest uh, to, to go above and beyond and develop people within your organization or outside, but you're also building that, that toolkit that's critical to becoming a, a leader and, and a manager. And I think, um, I think the key thing to being a good leader, I think it's, it, it can boil down to one thing, which is caring. 
mm-hmm. that I've, I mean, I've been working for a, a while and all the places that I enjoyed working, I had a great leader and what made them a great leader was that they cared about me. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that to me was the most important thing that it wasn't like, you know, I've had bosses who could be driving and, and, you know, kind of annoying, but the ones who cared about me, I did the best. Yep. I performed the best. I had the best experience. I still have those relationships. So I think if you're going to go on to that executive level, you really should know whether or not you have that ability to care. Mm-hmm. And, and not necessarily like a, a, always a warm, fuzzy care, but care about people care about people's development. Right, care about their success. And you know, to Jonathan's point around the mentorship, you know, there's kind of two sides to that. Being a mentor for sure, you know, look around your organization, who could use some help with transitioning into the organization? Maybe your company's not that great at onboarding people. You can volunteer to say, hey, new people that come into the organization, I would love to be their mentor as they come in. Um, if you're relatively young in your career, um, ask to mentor the interns over the summer. They're always in wanting to just suck up information from everyone around them. Give yourself that opportunity to see, you know, do you have that caring style? And everybody's caring style is very different. Um, but do, do you have that type of style? But on the flip side of that, go out and search for mentors for yourself to people whose approach and leadership style you like and respect, whether you've worked for them directly or not. Um, you would be surprised at how few executive uh, executives I've known in my life who have had more than one or two people across the course of a 30-year career approach them to say, I really admire you. I would love your mentorship and help. And 90% of the time, that's so flattering to someone that they truly do want to help you. And you know they can help you be specific about what you're looking for. You know, I'm, I like the way that you lead people, or I like the way that you problem solve, or I like the way that you convince the CEO to think about things differently. Be very specific about what you want to learn from them and then set up regular meetings, coffee, whatever it might be. Um, you walk around the building if they're if they're a walk and talker, whatever it might be, but you get that connection with them, you will gain so much knowledge. One of my best mentors in my life, my very first management um, role in recruiting, I knew I didn't know what I was doing. I approached somebody from finance whose style I I really appreciated. And the thing I told him was, I have four direct reports. They're all very different. And I feel like I'm not being effective with any of them. And he taught me what I still call the portfolio of leadership styles, how you need to adjust your approach based on the person that you're working with. And I specifically went to him to say, I like how you manage your people. I would love to learn that. Yeah, a few years ago, I uh, I asked a, a friend who owns about six restaurants here in D.C., not in my field, just for just general mentorship mm-hmm. and for maybe five or six months. And I've always had a coach. Mm-hmm. I should say always. Since for the last 23, 24 years, I've had a coach. Um, I think that's incredibly important if you want to uh, grow as a person and, and grow in work. So are there any other specific things that someone can do, Jonathan, like to reach out to uh, either the right agency, position themselves in the marketplace, have their resume be a certain way. What what is it that the folks can do? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, some of the nuts and bolts. You know, some of the nuts and bolts. I mean, st- LinkedIn is still very a very prominent tool for any level of recruiter. Um, so make sure you have you know a, a profile that isn't overly salesy, but but it's impactful and powerful in terms of telling your story and how compelling you might be uh, to a recruiter who's looking for someone in an executive position. Um, I think you uh, you need to you know. Well, I want to hold stuff. you on this for a second. So LinkedIn is a great resource. One of the things that we know about LinkedIn is that you can actually add content. Mm-hmm. So you can add documents that you write. You can add work product. You can add videos. So and they could be very simple stuff. Correct. You just take what it is that you're doing and kind of share it as best as you can. Mm-hmm. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, definitely. I mean, but just even just the the cleanliness of your profile, uh, the, demonstrating your progression even within company. Um, a lot of folks that 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 are some of the most impressive people I've ever met. Uh, I had to f- find out on my own because their LinkedIn profiles or resumes didn't didn't uh, advertise them as such. Um, the danger is being overly salesy and having too much content and too much data. So that's sometimes that's a bit of a turnoff. So it's got to be it's got to be balanced. But um, yeah, I think it's it's a very important thing that most, if not every recruiter in the world, uses today um, to identify candidates, uh, even at the executive level. Um, it, it gets back to that 
thought leadership piece and being visible. I mean, you got to be out in your ecosystems. You got to be talking to people. You got to be um, making good points in, in, in the right settings. You have to, you know, people are going to notice that. Uh, that's why, you know, I try to attend, you know, we'll have the H uh, Human Capital Institute event here in Boston in two weeks. You know, just meeting other leaders uh, in our field and, 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 and talking shop. Um, you know, you've got to put yourself out there and that's how you get noticed. Um, the world of applying to jobs, um, you know, looking up a, an ad in the newspaper uh, or, or looking for jobs online, um, you know, I'm sure Carol can relate. You know, we get flooded with applicants uh, hundreds by the week because it's so easy to apply online now. And people really, you know, view it as a black hole. And, and, and it really is um, because it's just volume. Um, you have to you have to separate that the quality from the quantity as a recruiter and as an organization. And that often comes through, you know, just classic networking uh, and referrals. Um, but then again, yeah, the, the thought leadership is very important. Um, when I recruit so let's uh, exactly. I wanna, I wanna, uh, just not go over that too quickly. So again, getting deeper into the thought leadership is that whatever you do, whatever how mundane it is or however obscure it is, if you can write three paragraphs about it and post it on the web, that's a good thing. Right. And you, an interesting observation you have about trends you're seeing going on in the space, challenges that you've had, um, how you've overcome them, great ways to share that um, via the publishing capability on LinkedIn. Um, I'm going to hit on a couple of other things on LinkedIn. And uh, <coughs> Jonathan, I think this was part of your making sure it's a clean profile. Please, for goodness sake, have a professional looking photo on your LinkedIn <laughs> profile. Yep. They've actually changed the terms of service yes. now. You cannot have like a logo or an icon on your... On this, your... They've, we're going to do a show on LinkedIn because yes. they're kind of... <laughs> They're doing a really bad job, I think. But anyway. Yes, but if you're looking for show. an executive level, VP level mm-hmm. position, make sure that that's a professional mm-hmm. profile. You know, have some you know, thought leadership, some some of your your point of view on whatever um, function you're in. And if you're not super comfortable writing on a regular basis, another great way on LinkedIn to be noticed is by commenting on other people's writing, having, you know, whether it's a counterpoint or adding to, you can get into some good conversations with folks I've made. You know, people have connected with we, me because of comments either one of us have made on each other's uh, posts. And then we've met up at conferences and we continue to talk to this day just from a, you know having a point or counterpoint to something that someone said. And to give you a sense, when we talk about thought leadership, it, it sounds like a little bit bigger than it has to be. Again, write something about what you do. Mm-hmm. Video something about, you know, do a little uh, video that you can put up on YouTube. Mm-hmm. But basically take some of what you're doing and share it with the world so that people can see it. That's what we're saying. Correct. So, um, Kara, how can folks, because we wrap up, how can folks reach out to you? Um, lots of ways. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, you can definitely reach out to me. I do prefer when you send me a note, say you heard me on your hired radio. That way I know how we're connected. Um, would love to connect with folks there. Um, I... Not as active on Twitter as I once was, but um, I'm trying to get better at that, uh, given my current workload. But that's at KL Yarnot on on Twitter. Great ways to reach out to me. My company is going to be launching our new website in two weeks. I have seven blogs queued up for that. I would welcome you to come to HireClicks.com and comment there and connect. Cool. Awesome. And Jonathan, how can folks reach out to you? Yeah, same thing. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Would love to connect with folks. And to Kara's point, um, definitely drop me in the line of, uh, where and how you've you heard of me. Um, you can also contact us at Wilson Human Capital Group. Um, interestingly, we're just building out a an executive uh, and leadership coaching practice. So if anyone's interested in that, um, to the points made earlier by both of you, uh, we've got a formal offering now uh, that we'd love to uh, discuss with the market, um, but always happy to do it informally and make make great connections. Um, I'm, I'm, I may be a millennial, but I'm not a social mediaite. Uh, I don't have Facebook or other uh, social media outlets. I tend to enjoy the phone and in-person interaction. So shoot me a note on LinkedIn um, and uh, would love to grab coffee. Great. Thanks. Thank you so much for being on our show. You've been listening to You're Hired. I'm your host, Lauren Epstein, here on 96.7 FM, Arlington, Virginia. We'll see you next week on another episode of You're Hired.